And so if you got your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 11, verses 9 through 13. Luke chapter 11. I never assume that everybody is a theologian in this room. So go to the New Testament. That's about halfway through your Bible. And Matthew, Mark, Luke, the third book of the New Testament, the third of the Gospels written by Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 11, verses 9 through 13, reads like this. If you don't have your Bible, it'll appear on the screen behind me. So I say to you, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. That's a good place to say amen. Hmm. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of your father... If your son asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake instead. Or if you ask for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. I love when the Bible's petty. <laughs> if you then, us, we who are evil, we who are not so good, we who are sinners, know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. Amen? If you're taking notes on this third part and final part of the B-I-B-L-E series, I want you to entitle it this, Pray the Scripture. Pray the Scripture. Or you can call it this, You promised. You promised. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for this day. For this is the day that you have made, God. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. God, before the earth began to spin on its axis, you knew each and every person that would be here. You're not surprised that we're here today. And God, we just want to thank you. May I lie down as you rise up. Don't let these words be my own, but let them come directly from your throne room of grace. God, open hearts, minds, and ears to be open and receptive to a word that will always be about Jesus. God, I thank you that before this is all said and done, somebody's going to meet Jesus that has never met him before, and somebody's going to come home that's been a long way off today. I pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody sit. Everybody sit. Take about five seconds and give Jesus some praise while I drink this water. Come on. Praise him like you know he woke you up this morning. Praise him like you're thankful that he's taking care of you. Come on. Thank you, Jimmy. Don't go too far, brother. Oh, man. So the B-I-B-L-E, we, we're reading out of the book of Luke um, today. The first uh, book that we read out of in this series was Acts. And the reason that Acts is connected to Luke is because they both had the same author. Um, Luke wrote the book of Acts literally as a continuation to the book of Luke. So literally Acts is like Luke part two, and it talks about the acts of the apostles as they were building the early church. The book of Luke is beautiful, though, because it is only one of two books in the Bible that we know of that are written by a Gentile. Luke was not a Jew. The rest of the authors of the Bible were Jews. Luke was a Gentile. What is a Gentile? A person that's not a Jew. So a lot of us in this room, unless you are Jewish, you are a Gentile. And Luke was not just a, any old Gentile. He was, he was a physician. He was an amazing writer. And he was a Gentile. And this book is addressed to the Gentiles. So just like Acts, this is only the second book and the only other book of the Bible that is like this that we know of. The book of Luke is the gospel account of Jesus that's written by a Gentile for the Gentiles, written for us to understand. When you try to break down a lot of the original words, you'll notice and understand that they are Greek words because it was not written by a Hebrew man. He's writing a letter, if you will, or a gospel account for the Gentiles, but specifically this one Gentile man, his name was Theophilus. He is addressed as the most excellent Theophilus, and Theophilus is a Greek word or Greek name that stands for one who loves God. So Luke is a man of God writing to a Gentile man that loves God. Once again, by the Gentiles for the God-fearing Gentiles. And he's writing this book once again to give a gospel account from our perspective 
of, of what Jesus' life was like. And I like the book of Luke because you find things in there that you don't see in the other Gospels. Because Luke was a physician, he gives details that you don't necessarily see uh, in, in the other gospel accounts. You might share some of the same stories, but some of the accounts are different. So um, the book of Luke also gives an account of when Jesus talks about the Lord's Prayer, as we were talking about, just as Matthew does. But you find little differences. One prime difference in Luke's gospel, when we see Jesus praying in the garden, we remember that before he goes to the cross, he prays. And Jesus says, not my will, God, let your will be done. And the Bible says an angel strengthens him. But Luke gives us a medical detail, actually, that nobody else shows us. It says that Jesus was under such stress that he sweat drops of blood. Well, that's an actual condition called hematidrosis. When anxiety builds up so much, the capillaries burst and your sweat glands begin to exude drops of blood. But Luke is the only one that writes it because he was the only one that would have been informed of what that would be. So I love the book of Luke. On your own, take time, read it. You're going to find a lot of amazing details. And before I can really dig into this, this scripture today that I just read, I once again, I want to give you context. OK, Jesus is with his disciples and his disciples say, Lord, teach us how to pray. John's disciples, John the Baptist, as we will be talking about, they know how to pray. He taught them how to pray. Teach us how to pray. And then Jesus goes and tell them, tells them the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. He tells them this prayer. And then after that. Right after, he tells a parable, and he tells the parable before the verses that I just wrote. And the parable, I like when I, well, I, like when I read the parables that Jesus gives, because I like to put myself in the parable. You ever put yourself in a parable? You put yourself in the parable because you think about how you might respond in the situation if it were you. He tells a parable about a neighbor. How many of y'all got neighbors out there? How many of you actually like your neighbors? Oh, less hands. Okay. I got I got I got some good neighbors, but Jesus tells this parable about a not so good neighbor. He's actually a really annoying neighbor. And the Bible talks about um, a man as he has put his children to sleep. It is literally the midnight hour. His kids are asleep. He's already put the alarm on. He is done. He was tired. He had a long day of work. He don't want to deal with nobody. It is midnight. He is in his bed chilling. He is already snoring. He is all the way off in dreamland already. And at midnight, he hears a knock on the door. Could you imagine if your neighbors knocked on your door at midnight after you was already sleeping? I'm from Carroll City. So if you knock on my door at midnight, one or two things is going to happen. I may ignore you, or I might greet you with Ching Ching Pao, because I don't know who comes to my door at midnight. So, God knocks on the door, and I would understand if somebody knocked on my door at midnight and it was an emergency. It's like, oh, we need the paramedics, something is happening here, oh, somebody's sick, somebody's hurting, I need your help. That's not why the guy knocked on the door. Could you imagine if you was in like a good sleep, like you was having a good dream, kids was already in bed, life is good, and somebody knocked on your door at midnight to get some loaves of bread? It's not that they couldn't afford loaves of bread or anything like that. No, 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 no. This was just an irresponsible neighbor. He did not have his fridge stuck. And what happens is he is asking for three loaves of bread because some of his friends came in town and he wasn't ready for them. You got the nerve to wake me up out my bed to give your friends, people I don't even know, my bread? You must be out your mind. Jesus says, the man who was sleeping, says, man, what's wrong with you? My kids is sleeping. You, you, you are crazy. And you come to my door knocking, asking for bread because you ain't have bread in your own to feed your ratchet friends that showed up at midnight? What's wrong with you? Jesus goes on to say, the man who woke up will give him what he asked for. You know why? Not because they're friends, 
but because of the audacity of the request. You ever gave somebody something just because you wanted to get them away from you? I can't, be- I, can't, I can't believe you this crazy enough to ask me for this. Because you just, you know what, here, just, just, take, just, just go. Just go. This is what is going on in this story. So God is, is trying to let us understand. Jesus is trying to tell us that sometimes we got to have a little more audacity with our faith. Oftentimes people pray and you know what they do? They pray for things that they know are easy to happen. That doesn't require your faith. I serve the God that, that's telling me, man, your request ain't outlandish enough. Your request ain't crazy enough. I don't know who I'm talking to today, but there are times in my life where I prayed things that did not make sense. We actually did it as a church. There was a young man that was literally dead and we prayed him back to life. What if we would have just said a cute prayer? Oh God, heal him on the other side in heaven. Oh God, let him go peacefully. No, we said, God, get him up from that bed in the name of Jesus. And that same man that was shot in the head by an AK-4 47 is walking, talking, and living and breathing today because we decided to ask God for things that don't make sense. Where is the audacity in your faith? I ain't got no time for these cute prayers, man. God, help me today. Help you do what? Be specific. Say something. Say, say like, I want, I want to say stuff that gets God's attention. <sighs> Hey, hey, God, hey, hey, we ain't got no money, but we need a whole building like yesterday. God's like, oh, I got one right over here. But see, if we don't believe like that, if we don't start talking like that, then we can't begin to see God manifest those things. I don't want to pray. I, I like, honest, this is going to sound crazy. I don't want to pray things I have faith for. I want to pray things I don't have faith for. Because those are the things I need God to show up for audacity in my prayers but then after he tells us we must have a little bit of audacity a little intestinal fortitude we got to be a little crazy when we pray then we get to Luke eleven nine. 9 it says asking you shall receive it says uh seeking you shall find knocking the door shall be open unto you it says you can't just pray crazy stuff too you got to be committed to what you're praying for There needs to be some persistence in your prayers. Some of us have prayed to God one time for something, and when we don't get it, it's like, oh, he's not a miracle worker. Sometimes it's not about what you ask. It's just the consistency in what you ask. God wants to see how annoying you're willing to be. there, there There are things literally that I have prayed for for years before they ever happened. That's why the Bible says things like, do not get weary in doing good, for in due season you will reap a harvest if you do not give up. Just because what you're praying for does not happen in this season doesn't mean it's not due to happen in another season. You just got to keep on praying and keep on believing. There needs to be some consistency and some persistence to your prayers. Okay, so I got to pray for crazy stuff and I got to keep praying for crazy stuff. But what, what, okay, so but what, what, what do I pray for, Pastor? What do I, what do I pray for? I know I got to get crazier in my request. I know I got to keep on going, but what should I constantly be praying about? What should I be asking God for? You see, people of God, we can't just see scripture. We can't just apply scripture. We must pray scripture. You want to know what to keep asking God for? Ask him for something he already promised in his word. Be consistent in that. Continually pray the promise. Why do you you continually pray the scripture? Because when you pray scripture, it helps you do two things. It helps you to remember and it helps you to remind. Remember and remind. Remember and remind. Remember what? When I pray scripture, one, it helps me remember the promises of God. I don't know about you, but I need to remember the promises of God. You see, what I found so often in life is that repetition is reputation. The things that I repeat are the things that I become. I would say the same thing about prayers. People say you are what you eat. I would venture out to say you are what you pray. You are 
what you pray? What, what, what are you, what's constantly coming out of your mouth? What promises of God are you constantly speaking? That's why the Bible says things in Proverbs 23, 7, like, for as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The things that you constantly let live in here will be the things that you become. The promises that you constantly pray will be the things that you see manifest. But here's the issue, though. Too many people focus on what they think over themselves. They don't take time to pray over themselves what God thinks about them. So how do you know that? Because we live in a social media generation that is very selfish. It's all about me, 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 me. And here's the problem with focusing on you. You know you. You know your problems. You know your issues. If you focus on you long enough, it's very depressing. Because instead of seeing all the greatness in you, what do we do as people? We nitpick all the issues that we have. It's no wonder that in 2020, one of the greatest health risks that we have is mental depression. Because so many people are focused on their mistakes. So many people are focused on their problems. So many people are focused on their anxiety that instead of speaking life, people have taken their life because they see all their problems without any solutions. It's a big issue. You see, I, 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 I don't have issues with mental depression or mental illness, but I understand why some people do because they don't speak life over themselves on a constant basis. I, I, I want to be very clear because I don't want to say something that is damaging. There are mental issues, man, where you actually need some real help. I just want, I want, I want to say, go get that. But I still believe that God can change your life in a moment. I, I, still, I still believe that, but go get some help too. Amen? Like, it's okay. Don't Like, so many times, like, we don't want to go to the doctor, and the doctor is the one that can save us. Don't be scared of your salvation. God can use anything to save you. Amen? Amen. So I think it's very powerful because we live in a world where we can, we can think ourselves and talk ourselves into a big mess. But I love the word of God because the word of God is my weapon against depression. I don't struggle. I just pray God's word. I pray God's word, and if you've ever been around me long enough and you've heard me pray, you'll know I repeat a lot of the same things when I pray. And nine times out of ten, it's a scripture. You know why? Because when I pray the things that God has already said about me, I don't have to worry about if it's going to happen or not. There are scriptures that have literally become a normal part of my life. I prayed one right before I started this, this message. I said, this is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. That is a promise. I am promised that God made this day, not me. If I made this day, it's a mess. If God makes this day, then I know I can look forward to what's coming next. I could, I could rejoice and I could be glad because I'm not in control over the outcome of this day. God is. Create me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. This is a promise that God is continually working on me. That I have not arrived. I am not perfect, but I am progressing towards the goal. David prayed this. David was a man after God's own heart. He killed people. He had adulterous affairs. He was crazy. He couldn't even get along with his own family, but God said he was still a man after God's own heart. So in Psalms 51 10, he says, created me a clean heart, oh God. This is the promise that I don't have to be perfect, but I can still make progress. Created me a clean heart, oh God, and renew every day. God should be renewing a right spirit within you. Why? Because there's things that you know you do, and there's things that you commit that you don't even know you do. So I need God to renew a right spirit within me. Oh, I love this one for God. You know the plans that you have for me. Plans to prosper me, not to harm me, but to give me a hope in the future. If I've ever prayed for you, I've probably spoken that over your life. Why? Because I don't know the plans that God has for you, but he does. And when you don't know, he does. And here's, here's the good news. They're plans to prosper you. 
There are plans for you to do well. God's intention is not to harm you, but he wants to give you hope because there's a lot of things out there that don't give you any hope. Look at the news. We can't even say hello to each other without worrying about how that's going to affect us. But God says, don't worry about all that. I'm going to give you hope for the future is in my hands. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Oh, I love that one. I could walk into any room with anybody, no matter what their stature is, and I don't have to worry about if I'm supposed to be in that room because if I walk in the room and Jesus is with me, I'm supposed to be there. I know how to move in a room full of vultures because it doesn't matter how big and scary they look, they're still not as big as my God. Whatever I do, my God is with me. Oh, here's a great one, Ephesians 2, 10, for Bible says that I am his workmanship. Some translations say that I'm a masterpiece created to do good work in Christ Jesus. If you ever had a low opinion about yourself, you, 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 ain't, you ain't just some run-of-the-mill human being. No, 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 no. You are a masterpiece. You know what a masterpiece means? The pinnacle of, the, of an artisan's work. It means that you are the mountaintop of what God created. That means when God made you, he broke the mold and said, there'll never be another one like you. You are created in my image. You are unique. You are special. You are different. And you're not just different. You are different for a purpose. Created to do good work in Christ Jesus. You're not created for a purpose. You're created for God's purpose. These are life verses that I constantly recite and I will continue to pray over you because I don't need to tell myself what I know. I need to tell myself what he says. See, speaking, speaking what I think over my life can kill me. Speaking what God knows over my life will build me. So I'm going to help you out today. I'm about to, if, if, if you ain't got no life verses, you ain't got none, I'm going to give you some. Okay? Don't be stealing mine. But I'm going to give you some. These are for you. And, 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 and I'm, I'm going to go through these real fast. This is how good God's word is. God's word is so good, like when you hear it, you should just shout because you hear the promises in it. You say, I don't know how to find no promises. I ain't no theologian. I'm going to give you a bunch of them right now. And I'm reading real fast, and they're going to go up on the screen, and you say, oh, I couldn't take notes. Don't worry about it. If we got your email, which most of you we do, we're going to send it out to you in the email this week. You're going to see, you're going to just get a list of promises that's going to bless you. You ready for them? Y'all want to hear some promises? Yeah, get ready now. Oh, you better, you better, you better start throwing stuff when I read these promises. Mm. You better shut this, this, this is good. You don't even need me to preach. You just need God's word. Oh, man, the Bible is nothing but a book of promises. It's nothing but a book of promises. Pray the promises of God. Exodus 14, 14. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. That's a promise. Exodus 20, 12. Honor your father and your mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord has given you. That's a promise. Isaiah 40, 29. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. That's a promise. Isaiah 40, 31. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. That's a promise. Isaiah 41 10. So do not fear for I am with you. Don't be dismayed for I am God. I will strengthen you and help you and uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's a promise. Isaiah 41 13. For I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you do not fear. I will help you. That's a promise. Isaiah 54 10. Though the mountains may be shaken and the hills be removed yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken nor my covenant of peace be removed says the Lord who has compassion on you that's a promise Isaiah 54 17 no weapon formed against you shall prosper and you will refute every tongue that accuses you this is the heritage of the servant of the Lord and this is their vindication from me declares the Lord that's a promise James 1 5 if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given to you. James 4, 7, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's a promise. First John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, then he is faithful and just that he will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. That's a promise. Second Chronicles 7, 14, if my people 
who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. That's a promise. Deuteronomy 31, 8. The Lord himself goes before you and he will be with you and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. That is a promise. Philippians 4, 19. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That's a promise. So Psalms 23, 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff come for me. That is a promise. So when I want to get all messed up about what I think about myself, I don't have to pray words that I know. I can pray words that he said. I don't go to God and pray the problem. When I pray to God, I don't pray the problem. I pray the promise. Some of y'all telling God your problems like he don't know. You spend so much time in prayer. Oh, God. Uh, they left me. I lost my job. They don't like me no more. They talking about me. Stop, stop complaining to God about stuff that he probably set in motion to get you away from them stinking people in the first place don't pray the problem pray the promise pray the prom I ain't, I ain't got I ain't got like my time and my communication and my conversation with God is so precious I don't waste it on complaining I spend my time speaking the promises of his word I don't keep telling myself what I think about the situation. I just say what his word is promised about the situation. You got to stop seeing scripture as scripture and start seeing scripture as promise. Because here's the thing. I'm God's son. I'm his child. You're God's son. You're God's daughter. You're his child. That means God is our father. You know the beautiful thing about God being a father and us being children? You say, I can't, I can't remember scripture. Let me tell you why that's not true. Because you're a child and children never forget a promise. They never forget a promise. You see, we don't just, we don't just pray scripture to remember the promise. We pray scripture to remind God of the promise. You say, what? Hold on, pastor. We remind God. Let me start off by saying, God has not forgotten. God doesn't forget anything. He doesn't need a reminder. Nothing slipped his memory. Why do I say remind God of the promise? Because now I'm a father, and I see God a little differently as a father. Helps me understand him a little bit better. And I got a daughter, and I love her. Let my child have a field trip. I'm going to hear about that field trip every day until that field trip comes. My child has, a, has an issue reminding me of things I already know. I paid for the field trip. I packed your lunch for the field trip. I signed the permission slip. I know you got a field trip. Dad, I got a field trip. I'm like, Baba, that field trip ain't until three weeks away. Dad, it's a field trip, though. We got to be there early. You know the bus leave five. I got a field trip. Field trip. Field trip, I got field trip, field trip, week up, field trip, field trip, field trip, field trip, they field trip, field trip, field trip, field trip, field trip, field trip. I'm like, I know! You got a field trip. Field trip. I know you got a field trip. I made sure the field trip happened. But you know why I love that my child reminds me of things I already know? Because it shows me what's important to her. She can't remember to clean her room, but she remember that field trip. I love that very word, remind. So beautiful. It means to bring something, especially a commitment or a necessary course of action to the attention of someone. And when we pray scripture, we pray the promise and we, we continually pray the promise. We bring the commitment or the necessary course of action to the attention of the promise keeper. 
Such a beautiful thing. You see, I love God because he tells us I'm not a man that he should lie. So, so if he says it, he's got to do it. He's obligated. He is bound by his own words because God cannot go against anything that he says. That's why he says, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door will be open. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. The one who knocks the door will be open. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If, if you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. So I love this because Jesus starts off by saying we need to be, we need to have more audacity, more gall in the things that we're asking God. But then he's saying, hey, you need to be really committed to your ask. You need to be persistent. But then I love Jesus because with, 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 with the slightest shift in topic, he goes from knocking and the door being opened and asking and receiving. He goes from that to showing God as a father. And he compares it to earthly parents. He say, hey, y'all are sinners. And you know how to give good gifts to your kids. How much more does God know how to give gifts to his children? And I think it's remarkable. I'm gonna ask you a question and just raise your hand if it's true. Is there anybody out there and somebody made you a promise and they broke it? You know why we know how to give good gifts to people? Because let me ask you this. Did it feel good when they broke the promise to you? Because we know how it feels when a promise is broken, we are more inclined to keep our promises. If we feel that way, God who has never broken a promise, how much more is he willing to come through on his word? You see, if God says it, it's got to happen. And I love this because we get to see God as who he is. He is our Abba Father. He is amazing. Hallelujah. Parents, you know this to be true. But if you promise your kids something, you better be ready to keep it. <laughs> I, I hear Ben up here on offering, talking about his baby girl. She only been here for two months. But I know it's not a bone in your body that will break a promise to that little girl. It's a father's love. I've had, the, I've had the privilege of being a dad for a little bit longer <laughs> to my beautiful baby girl, Vava, who just turned 10. And I've been traveling a lot lately, you know, going to preach in different places. I was in Canada one week, I was in Virginia another week, I'm in Atlanta this week, and Birmingham the next week. And as I go, you know, I always miss my family. I love my family because there's things that we do each and every morning because, you know, as, as the head and priest of my home, I want to make sure I set the example. So when I'm home, I make sure before we, we before Baba goes to school, we grab hands, me and my wife and my child. Sometimes the dogs, they, they want to, like, sit on our leg while we press. Like, it's weird. A animals got something about them, man. It's so strange. They like know when you're doing certain things and they just want to be around. My, my, my dog's filled with the Holy Ghost. I believe it. <laughs> Anyways, we start praying in the morning. We always uh, make Baba pray first. You know, she's 10 now. She, like, you can pray. Ain't nothing wrong with your mouth. Pray. So she pray, and it just makes me laugh the stuff that she prays for. She's like, dear God, thank you, Jesus, so much for this day. Uh, thank you for my mommy and my daddy. God, thank you for Miss Thomas. That's her teacher. Kids love their teachers. Thank you for Miss Thomas. Help me be good for Miss Thomas. I'm like, you need to pray that he help you be good for me. Help me be good for Miss Thomas. Uh, help me learn. Um, help me to remember. God, help me clean my room. I'm like, God don't need to help you with that. You just need to get up and clean it. She be praying for y'all too. Say, God, help cool church. 
help the people, help it, help, help it grow. She made me laugh because the other day it just shows you like what kids think about a real situation. She's like, God, help the church grow to 200 people. I'm like, baby girl, he answered that request a long time ago. Long time ago. Amen. <laughs> a God, help me be better and to behave. Help, 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 help me. Um, keep, keep me safe. Keep my family safe. Bless us. Protect us. Uh, a- amen. And I, I just, I love my baby girl because she's understanding how to pray. So when I'm away, I miss that. So what I usually do, I jump on FaceTime. Thank God for technology. And uh, we pray on FaceTime. But this one morning, man, it, uh, I slept in a little too late because I was, I preached like four messages the day before. So I was just dead to the world. And when I woke up, I was like, oh, man, let me make a call. It was about 10 to 15 minutes later than we usually do it. And by the time I, I rang my wife to, to, to do this prayer with my baby girl and her, baby girl was already at school. My wife was like, you missed it. You were sleeping. We done prayed and everything. I was like, man, I know I'm going to hear this. I know I'm going to hear it later. So as soon as Baba came from school, my wife had her. She was like, Dad! I said, yeah, hey, baby girl, how you doing? She's like, you missed prayer this morning. I said, yeah, I, I, I know, I know. I'm, I'm sorry. She's like, she was like, Dad, you got to promise me something. You know, man, your kids ask you to make a promise. You got to, you got to, you know. It's like, Dad, you got to promise. When I call, you pick up. I said, okay. Say, wait, she's 10 years old. One, my child ain't got no phone. I know where she at. I drop her off. I pick her up. What you need a phone for? Okay. She ain't got no phone. But she figured out we had these things called Google Homes in our house. You can call people on the Google Home. You can say, hey, Google, call dad. When she says that, it rings my phone no matter where I'm at. And I know it's the Google Home. It's either them or a telemarketer because when they call, it says no caller ID on my phone. So I got to take the risk. I'm like, it's either a telemarketer or it's Vava. I gotta be. So she put me to the test real quick. I said, all right, baby girl, if you call, I'm going to pick up, no matter what, no matter what I'm doing. Thank God she ain't called me when I was preaching. She called me like, <laughs> I hung up the phone, it was like a minute later, Brrr, no caller ID. I'm like, hello? Hi, Dad. Just checking. Bye, Dad. I was like, okay. Okay. Smart. <laughs> she did that a few times throughout the day. <laughs> I'm like, you ain't got homework to do? About 10 o'clock at night. Her bedtime's nine. Brr, brr, no caller ID. It's okay. Hello? Hey, Dad. I'm like, bye-bye. It's past your bedtime. Go to sleep. I love you. Bye, Dad. Click, click. Next morning, dead to the world. Freezing again. Five, my, my child gets up so early. She tells Google when to wake her. Hey, Google, set an alarm for her. 5.30 in the morning. Brr, I almost missed it, man. I picked it up. <laughs> Hello? Good morning, Dad. <laughs> I was like, this is, my, this is my good morning. I just woke up voice. Hello, Vava. She's like, Dad, you sleep? Like, she is fired up. I'm like, did you drink coffee? Like, what is wrong with you? Morning, Dad. You sleep? I was like, yes. Okay, so Kimmy said this and this and that. I'm like, she didn't care I was sleeping? She done went on to have a 10-minute conversation with me on this phone. I don't even know what she said. Cause like when, when I don't like really be knowing what she said, I don't know what it said. I'm like, that's interesting. <laughs> so we did that for a while. I was by that. I was like, this, this child is something else. It didn't matter though. What time she called me? Because I made a promise I would pick up that phone call no matter what, I was obligated to the promise that I made. And I want somebody to hear me very clearly. What you need to understand as a father, that when you pray God's promises, when you pray the things that he has said to you that he would do, He is now obligated to action because of what you have said based in his word. If I'm a human and I understand that, 
How much more does your Father in heaven respond to your requests when we ask? You see, just because you don't have something in the season that you ask for it doesn't mean that the request isn't being answered. God just may be doing other things in the supernatural that you don't see so he can line up the natural things to answer the request when you call. But just because you don't see it happening doesn't mean that God's hands aren't moving. Our God is obligated as a father to the promises that he makes. So that's why he says, do not get weary in doing good in due season. You'll reap a harvest if you do not give up. Some of us have given up thinking that God will not come through on the promise. But he says, hey, you got a part in that to play too. You can't give up. But the greatest promise that I think is in this entire book is the one that's not just for some of us. Because this promise, this is for all of us. This one has no stipulations on it. This one doesn't say if you don't give up. This one uh, uh, doesn't, d- doesn't say for the righteous. No, no, no. There's one promise in this book. It's for all of us. And it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And I don't know where else in the Bible it says this, but it says, whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Hold on, man. This promise is for all of us. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, find another verse that says that. Whosoever. Let me translate whosoever for you. Anybody in this room, anybody outside this room, when you don't believe, when you're giving up hope, if you're a liar, if you're a cheater, if you steal, if you messed up before you walk in that room, if you identify as something other than what God made you, regardless of your sexuality, regardless of your actions, that word tells me whoever Stop trying to put stipulations on whoever. The promise doesn't say for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that if you act like him and walk like him and talk like him, you shall receive eternal. Whosoever for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that if you look a certain way, if you love a certain way, if you think a certain way, no, 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 no. This promise is not for us, but it's for those that are a long way off. This is the kind of church that you don't have to believe before you belong because you belong before you believe. I want you to understand my heart when I say this and you say, no, that's, 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 that's false doctrine because God ain't going to keep people out of heaven for what they do. I'm just going by what the promise says. You could add your religiosity or your, or, or, or your pharisaical notions on top of what God said, but it's not God's word. God says, whoever believeth in him, whoever believeth in him, whoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. There's only one person in the Bible that I am sure is in heaven right now because the Bible doesn't talk about anybody else this way. And you know who it was? It was the person that was on the cross right next to Jesus being killed by the Roman government for insurrection. Jesus looked at him and said, surely you will be with me in paradise. He didn't have his walk right. He didn't have his talk right. He didn't have his actions right. But because the word says whosoever, God made that promise for him. If he made the promise for the one that deserved to die for doing wrong how much more does your father in heaven know how to give good gifts to his children I don't pray my problem I pray God's promise that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life